Hello. Uh, again, thank you so much for uh, uh, honoring me with the Joe McKaylee Award, and it's my real pleasure to be here um, speaking at uh, this wonderful meeting that we have been attending for many, many years. Mm -hmm. So my topic is an interesting one. It, the question posed to me is, is multiple myeloma curable? Mm -hmm. Um, these are my disclosures. Now, when we talk about whether it is curable, the first question is, what is the definition of cure? And almost 50 to 60 years ago, cure was defined as uh, suggesting um, that probably after one or two decades of treatment, um, there may be a group of patients who are disease-free whose actual death rate from all causes is similar to that of normal population um, with similar age and sex distribution. So they would have a similar lifespan as other people. This definition has been defined and redefined a little bit. For example, in 71, um, there was a definition which suggested that cure should be unassociated with continuing morbidity from the disease or its treatment. And, uh, there are various caveats that we can also talk about in the in the myeloma field, but there is clear definition that patients would not die from myeloma, um, but from something else. And using that definition, um, the question is, is myeloma curable? Now here, what you see is that the red line suggests the, the survival of normal population without the cancer. And on the left, you see various lymphomas, which are curable, and you can see that there is clearly the survival of patients with lymphoma reaches that red line. On the right side, the myeloma, very big difference. So the survival of myeloma in general using some of the data um, was not right there where we can see where lymphoma is. And so then we have a question then should we even be discussing this, that is it curable? And the reason there is great hope is this large data that has come from total therapy program at University of Arkansas where I was part of it for almost one decade. And here over successive years of treatment, it has become clear that the patients in remaining in complete remission gradually increases and is beginning to reach a level um, where there is hope that some of the patients may not be relapsing anymore. And this is a data that has been um, accumulated over 10 to 20 years, so it's large annotated data, and we'll go into this data further, but because of this type of data, there is hope that we may be curing patients. And then, so the first question I would discuss would be, how to cure myeloma? Um, what are the prerequisites for curing? And then we say, well, are we curing or not? So how to cure myeloma? The first important principle is the first shot gives us the best chance. This is true for myeloma, true for all cancer, that the first shot should be the best shot. Now, why is that? And the reason is uh, based on a lot of data. So one of the in information that came from Dr. Young's work um, in, uh, that the initial treatment provides the best chance of deep and durable responses. When patients were followed um, over successive line of treatment, it was seen, as you see on the left side, that as patients go from one to another line, that because of the frailty, because of the risk of the disease, number of patients getting to the next line of treatment decreases and sometimes quite clearly in a linear fashion. So they may not even get to the second and third line. And the second one, over time, there is diminishing return as you give successive line of treatment, there are rest, lead responses and the duration also diminishes. So keeping this in mind, it is best to apply the first treatment um, in, the, in the most optimal way. Now, why is this case, why is the earliest treatment better is shown in this uh, uh, genomic evolution concept or disease heterogeneity complex. As myeloma starts or a plasma cell disorder starts from one cell, acquires more mutation at an earlier stage. Eventually, one of the cells become malignant, grows really out of control, takes over the disease. But as the time passes, more and more changes are accumulating. And this is what we have to keep in mind. So if we then look at the clonal variants in myeloma, over time, the clonal variants from diagnosis and throughout the disease, it persists 
and increase in, it, in its complexity. And it, this is under evolution, under the pressure of treatment and various other factors. So you could see that at the time of relapse, there are many more clones and we may have to deal with more complexity than the earlier time point. And this is the biological molecular reason to try the first shot as the best treatment. So, so here we um, studied uh, a, 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 in our group, um, large number of patients, uh, 200, uh, 200 plus patients, and then 75 with relapse and 84 with relapse refractory disease, some paired samples with whole genome sequencing at a very deep level. And also uh, for with RNA sequencing and some of them for epigenomics. And using this data, uh, Dr. Samur showed that in myeloma patient in the whole genome, there are over 11,000 mutations per patient, very complex genome. Um, and you could see that if you look at somatic changes, there are many, many frequent changes. And if you look at subtypes of myeloma, you also see there is variability. In this same sem uh, seminar, uh, wonderful series, um, a few years ago, I was doing a topic to talk on how many myelomas are there. And it tells us there are multiple myelomas. Um, and so you look at various mutational patterns within various subgroup of myeloma. So this complex disease is how does it grow and evolve? So we looked at all this mutation and tried to see what processes might have caused this mutation. And a very interesting fact came out. So we saw that when the mutational signatures are clonal, those happened earlier on when the disease was in smaller ring or AMCA stage. Mm -hmm. And when you see it subclonal and less subclonal, it's more recent. And we find that DNA repair related pathways are significantly involving myeloma at a later stage and in the ongoing basis. Um, similarly, high-risk disease, you could see significantly higher apoBEC signature versus for hyperdiploid myeloma, that is less. And actually based on this, we have come up with a model that suggests that for the lower risk myeloma, the age and Ig hypermutation may be early change in development of the disease and DNA repair pathway takes over in the later component. While for high-risk disease, there is an intermediate stage which is significantly impacted by apoBEC related mutations and then DNA repair takes over. So keeping this in mind, um, DNA repair is an important component of what may be happening in, um, in myeloma, especially at a later stage and especially over time uh, as we treat the disease. And, and so Dr. Samur uh, recently published this interesting analysis where he developed this genome SCAR score, which suggests how much DNA damage that is being accumulated or has been accumulated, and it can be a numerical score. And using this score and using a recursive partitioning analysis, he could divide the patient into four groups. One of the group, which is a low genome score, a genome SCAR score, and also has um, gain of chromosome nine was the one group. Um, and then on the, on the right side, there are patients who have high genome score and does not have gain of nine and looked at their survival. And for the first time, Using this kind of analysis, he has now developed an uh, algorithm to identify the good risk group. We all look at high risk myeloma, what to do with it. I think it's equally important we look at good risk myeloma who live long and do well. Um, and that's an important group to identify. And he shows that over a period of six plus years, none of the patients in that group has yet died. And this data has been validated now in the COMPASS data showing similar, there is some uh, attrition here, but um, again, significantly better outcome in this patient population. And so we are beginning to know which patients do well, which may not do well. And the theory that we have to pursue is that all of them still needs very good treatment, even though they may have good risk. Now, using the same data, he, Dr. Samur has identified that if patients have a high mutation rate, high mutation burden, basically suggests more unstable genome, those patients have a poor outcome compared to those who have low mutational burden. And we have to keep this in mind as we treat because high burden, more change, more evolution, bad outcome, and that will affect our curability. And to top it all, there is this evolutionary phenomenon would lead to keep on acquisition of new changes. So you could see that there are two types of evolution, the linear evolution and branching evolution, where you could see that group of uh, clones might disappear, but a lot of new clones come up. And we observe that sometimes when the new clones come up, 
now they are the drivers of the subsequent disease. And that's what we may need to target. And this evolution happens because of many mechanisms. There are inherent genomic mechanisms, there is epigenomic drivers, there's a microenvironmental influ influences, and more importantly, under the pressure of therapy. And so we have to keep this in mind. And if we take a very good example of a patient, this patient had smoldering myeloma, had some complexity in genome, when this smoldering patient became uh, symptomatic myeloma, many more changes were acquired, including mutational changes. And when the patient relapsed, it became more complex. But importantly, when we combine all these three data and just look for larger structural variants, you could see that number of them are appearing and number of them are disappearing. And so as we treat the disease early, we can have a better outcome in this patient population. And not only in myeloma, but we have also studied patients who have progressed from smoldering myeloma to myeloma. And we find that in smoldering myeloma, actually in the beginning, um, there is significantly high mutational burden. And there are patients with 8,000 and more mutations here. Their patterns look very similar for specific mutations. And when they evolve to myeloma, this is the same patient smoldering to becoming myeloma. And we have compared what changed when they became myeloma, we find two patterns. One is where we don't see a significant change. And the second pattern is where we see branching evolution. New clone comes up. So branching evolution and no significant change. And we identified that those who had no significant change when be, they became myeloma from smoldering disease, their time to progression was very quick a median of seven months. What it tells us is that these smoldering patients are really myeloma. We are just waiting for them to have a fracture or, or a kidney fail, and then we're treating. And these are the patients who should be treated earlier on at the smoldering stage with all the full best treatment we know. On the other hand, this group of patients with branching evolution, they took longer time, two and a half years. And that suggests that this is still not myeloma. They need to acquire something more to become genomic, more aggressive, and then develop the disease. And these are the patients where we may think about a preventative strategy. So the point is that we may need to start early in this kind of patient population where it is almost myeloma, um, just without the end organ damage, and then we may get the best response. And what leads to this evolution from myeloma to progressive disease, et cetera? We have studied a number of processes that may be operative, the processes which are predominantly DNA repair related homologous recombination, apex activity, and various other activity. And we have developed assays, in vitro assays, where we can now take patient sample and measure this activity using few number of cells. So moving forward in near future, we may have some of these criteria that may help us identify this patient population. But overall, um, um, using this uh, screen, we can also find drugs to prevent them. And now we are beginning to understand that. To give one example, uh, Dr. Shamas in our group has studied homologous recombination. He has shown that HR is high in myeloma and the high HR leads to acquisition of new mutational changes over time. And if you inhibit HR by drug or by knockdown of RAD51, you can significantly decrease the acquisition of new change. And, and this HR, induction of HR can also lead to development of drug resistance, as you see here, dexamethasone resistance. So we have to keep those things in mind. And one of the genes that is important in myeloma and we have identified is called Apex1 gene. And by introducing this gene in a normal cell, we can cause significant genomic chaos, chromosomal changes, uh, certain new SNPs come up, certain new pathways are activated. And when we introduce into a fish, zebra fish, we could see development of tumor. Here, there's an MRI of the fish showing uh, a tumor, and also uh, you can see an eye tumor develop. So these are critical pathways that may be inducing and causing progression, and they're a good target for our future therapeutic purpose. So yes, I think I have made a case that first shot should be the best, will give us the best chance, but also what do we do with that first shot? Now we know we have lots of good drugs in myeloma. For example, over a period of last almost 50 years, 129 drugs have been evaluated in 228 trials in 7,000 7, patients. And what we know today is the threshold for response rate for regulatory approval is 15 to at the most best or response of 20% because over time there's diminishing return. So we can get a drug approval with 20% response rate. And now we have triple and pentarefractory disease. 
So it's good to use the new drug for approval for this purpose, but we need to take them up uh, in the upfront setting because as you can see here, um, when we combine the drugs approved for the later disease stage in the newly diagnosed setting, we get better responses. So now we are beginning to get 100% response rate with three and four drug regimen, including antibody with RVD-like combination. And we see 50% of patients achieving complete remission. So start early, but also start with your best shot. We don't want to keep something for the later time. But that's because the second criteria for cure would be that we need to attain a deep response, as deep as we can. And the deep response is a concept has been quite well described in this uh, cartoon, where it shows that majority of the patients relapse in myeloma, but those who have a better outcome are the ones who had the most significant decline in their myeloma burden. What is traditionally described as minimal residual negativity. So if you see the various patient population who get inadequate, although they had a CR, there is still enough myeloma burden that they would relapse within a certain period of time. However, when we get it down to a very low level, minimal residual disease that can be detected, those patients have the best outcome, not only longest PFS or OS, but also possibility of getting a cure. Because if you leave myeloma cells, then obviously there would be relapse at some point in time. So we need to decrease it, um, this burden. Now, is there a good data? Yes, there's a lots of data over the period of last year. So we recently published um, a meta-analysis using 93 publications that has ever looked at MRD with over 8,000 patients in this analysis. And what you could see that in newly diagnosed transplant eligible patients, for example, here, patients who are MRD negative, the yellow line, have significantly superior PFS compared to those who did not get MRD negativity. And this is true also for newly diagnosed transplant ineligible patient, and also now evolving data that even in relapse setting, MRD negativity provides much better outcome in this patient population. So MRD, getting MRD negativity is a very important point. And how do we get MRD negativity in the, in the beginning? Of course, we have to do the best treatment and bring them early. One of the most important development of last couple of years has been immunotherapy. And one of the approaches for immunotherapy that is so very effective is the CAR T cell approach. So uh, recently a number of presentations were uh, 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 discussed at the recent ESCO and EHA meeting. And one of the example was the use of IDA cell, which is BCMA CAR T cells in relapsed refractory myeloma. And what you see here is a, the significant proportion of patients are now getting MRD negativity. So 79% of patients achieving CR were MRD negative. And if you look at MRD negative in patients who are VGPR, almost 50% of them had achieved MRD negativity. And so high MRD negativity, and these are the patient population who are in the sixth and beyond line of treatment, median sixth line of treatment. So now when we take this treatment to earlier stages of the disease, obviously we'll get deep responses that may end up being more durable and provide the best outcome. So third question of cure is, should the cure mean life without treatment? And this is where the concept of maintenance and length of concept uh, maintenance comes into picture. Um, this is the data courtesy of uh, Professor McCarty, which shows that phase three studies using consolidation maintenance regimen um, in transplant eligible newly diagnosed patient and the PFS is significantly superior in all this study when patients get maintenance. So that's one important point of maintenance. Um, to prevent disease recurrence. And the second point would be um, that longer maintenance provides better outcome. So this was the data again um, provided by Professor McCarthy and Professor Gay. And it shows that patients who got longer maintenance, more than two years in two of these Italians, uh, the European studies, EMN studies, had significantly superior overall survival compared to those who got shorter maintenance. So the concept is, we may have to give them long maintenance. And so the point we have to keep in mind that if patients are continuing on maintenance treatment and not relapsing, that does not take away the possibility of calling a cure there. And the example I give and we all give to patients is that myeloma is becoming like a chronic disease, like diabetes. Can you cure diabetes? Not really. 
but you can take the medicine or take injections of insulin go about your life. And so if you have to continue taking a drug, um, you may or may not need um, to take them off. Now, given this, I, I do believe that at some point in future, we would have good data to show that patients who are MRD negative can get certain years of maintenance and then we can take it off. But I think we're not there to say that at the moment. And importantly, um, long-term maintenance might depend eventually on using immunotherapeutic approaches and there are a number of active and passive immunotherapy are being described here from adaptive to IO therapies to therapeutic vaccines. And I believe that this may end up being uh, a non-toxic long-term maintenance in patients who have achieved good responses. So we may still stay tuned for achieving this kind of responses in this patient population, which will sustain their MRD negativity and good response. So we have to keep that in mind. So then if we go to the um, and last question, should cure mean disappearance of all clones or can an indolent MGUS-like clone be acceptable? Patients remain uh, in MGUS all their life, 30 years, never get disease, never get needed treatment. So if we can make myeloma to MGUS, is it a cure or not? And I think um, that's something we should discuss. And, and, and we have enough data, existing data, which shows that there are certain patients who do end up becoming like MGUS and being sustained. And so if you look at the MRD data I just showed you earlier with 8,000 patient analysis, it clearly shows that in newly diagnosed transplant eligible patient, of course, MRD negative patients, um, you are beginning to see uh, a flattening of the curve, but you also should see that at, even at a lower level, patients who are not MRD negative, there is a flattening of the curve. What it suggests is that those patients have a presence of a clone, which is not growing, and patients are not relapsing. And those patients obviously have now acquired a, a phenotype of MGUS. And, and so we have to keep in mind that some proportion of patients may be in that category. And I would also suggest that those patients should be considered in the group, um, whether we call it a cure, or whether we call it a long-term disease-free survival, um, I think it's a semantic of the words. So then we come back to the original question. Is myeloma curable? Or I would say, are we curing myeloma? And there is interesting data available at this point. And so I've come back to the same data. If you looked at this uh, large meta-analysis, where overall survival was evaluated as well in for over 4,000 patients, you could see that there is a clear flattening of the survival curves. You could see that. Um, not seen yet in relapsed refractory disease, but in this patient population where follow-up has been over 10 years, you see flattening of the curve. And if you look at the PFS, which I just showed you earlier, there is clearly flattening of the curve beyond eight and 10 years. And, and these patients obviously are not dying from the disease and a proportion are not even relapsing from their remission MRD negative status. And what would we call these patients then? They're obviously long-term disease-free survival um, uh, in that regards. There was also wonderful data that uh, I uh, received from Dr. Matthias, where she has shown in two of the um, studies um, uh, where um, PFS close to 10 years and, and beyond um, has been 34% in one study, 24% in another study. So patients, and the curves here has not yet flattened totally. However, you could see a tail um, with some um, patients who have not relapsed, uh, long PFS, uh, more than 10 years. Again, suggesting the same thing. One of the suggestions was that a, it, myeloma could be considered potential curable disease if the fraction of patients who are in continued complete remission at 10 years, which is 40 to 50%. And I think we are inching towards that if we use that artificial definition, but it's still an important point and a target to achieve. So then uh, a large meta-analysis was done of all the patients treated across the globe in different clinical trials, 7,200 patients. And this study was done by um, Dr. Usmani. And what this analysis showed was that there was a certain fraction of the patient, around 15%, who beyond 15 to 20 years it shows a flattening of the curve. And that by certain definition could be called as a cure fraction of 15% or so. 
In a separate analysis of a similar large close to 2,500 to 3,000 patient data from Arkansas, where all the patients had undergone transplant over a period of last um, um, 30 years, close to 25 to 30 years. Um, when looked at year of first transplant and patients who are meeting or exceeding their predicted remaining years of life, suggesting that these proportion of patients are not dying from myeloma, their life expectancy has been similar to what you would expect for patients with similar sex and age and ethnic, ethnic background, and meaning they have less impact on their lifespan from myeloma. You could see that this proportion has been between 10 to 18%, median comes to around 15%, similar to the analysis by Professor Osmani. And so it suggests that proportion of patient, there is a cure fraction that we have to keep in mind. Now, what, where does it put us into the setting of uh, curative cancers? So if you look at the previous slide that I showed you and look at the data, event-free survival data of childhood AL, ALL, which we know is curable, you could see that we are somewhere between the last two things, but we have gone above what was 1950s. We are now coming off of the age and um, coming at around 15 to 20% where the curves are flattening on our side. So we have to keep in mind that we have climbed up. I've shown this same slide a few years ago where we were close to 1950 or below. We have now inched up a very promising sign of what, where myeloma is growing. Now, so the question finally back to us is, so when is patient cured? When would we make that definition? So I'll give you three examples. This was a study done at a large cancer center. Over 130 oncologists, specialists, who were asked this question and they answered it. And it's very interesting and very educational. So case one given to them was, a man received chemotherapy for testicular seminoma 20 years ago, and he's no evidence disease since then. How many oncologists said that this patient is cured? 93%, not 100%. We believe seminoma is cured, 20 years. There were two, still two oncologists who did not agree to that, were still skeptic. Second scenario, a woman treated with CHOP for DLBCL 20 years ago has remained NED since. Is this woman cured? How many said? 83%, 17% did not feel yet that this patient is cured 20 years later. In a third scenario, a woman treated for stage one ER positive infiltrating ductal carcinoma 20 years ago when patient was 47. She has received surgery, has received adjuvant four cycles of adriamycin and cytoxan, and then five years of tamoxifen and has been NED ever since. How many people said the patient is cured? 47.6%. So these are curable cancer. And we are not still saying as an oncologist that patients, these patients are cured. And that is illustrative of what I would conclude that we as oncologists are optimists. We always believe that there will be a cure, but we are super cautious. We are, I would almost say afraid to call a cure. Even one late relapse, bothers us to come out and say that there is a cure. Of course, testicular cancer is cured, but there were still some who were worried after 20 years. So as a conclusion in myeloma, what I would submit that it is not only a curable disease, but we are already curing a proportion of patient between 15 and 20%. And I think it is increasing by the day. And this many proportion of patients live their normal lifespan and eventually die from other causes of the, of, the, of the life, not from multiple myeloma, and who should be considered as cured by number of definition we have utilized. The important task for us now is to increase this proportion. We are at 15 to 20%, including CAR T cells, all the new antibodies, all the new agents. We now have to get this to 50% and above where it is meaningful. Take, we'll take time because we need to wait um, to get the real data. But I think we are getting there and it's the most encouraging sign that we are curing myeloma. So I would highlight the, my colleagues who have done some of the work I presented in my own lab and also uh, my other collaborators, in, first and foremost, my dear friend and colleague, uh, uh, 
Professor Anderson, my bioinformatics group, um, uh, especially Mehmet Samal Kamur, and my colleagues at IFM who I work with. So it's been a real pleasure and a real honor to be here and give this lecture. Thank you very much.